Well, hi, everybody. Welcome along to this special, extraordinary episode of Monday Night Live. And with me, I have Pete, my friend Pete from the States, Pete Espel, the ex-Marine, the Catholic, the the the, the amazing uh, counsellor and, and, and youth worker and psychologist. Psychologist, can I say that? Or is it, what, what should I it's call a, you? I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Oh, th- there you go, mate, you know. They're, them, them, there is farting words around here. Um, so, um, so, t- but tonight we're going to be talking about in this episode today, we're going to be talking about our top 10 Westerns plus our honorable mentions. So, we thought that uh, we would um, take you on a bit of a trip, some of you down memory lane. Some of you are probably going to be sitting there throwing things at your screen and disagreement, I'm sure. Other, other times you'll be going, yes, they've got that spot on. And uh, for those who maybe haven't watched too many Westerns, this could be some good uh, recommended holiday viewing since we're in the Christmas holiday break now. Um, before I do that, though, I should say this. This is important. Spoiler alert. <laughs> if you haven't seen any of these Westerns, there's probably going to be some spoilers. Uh, we'll try not to ruin too much, but there are going to be some spoilers. So, you know, if you hear a film title and you think, oh, I, I want to watch that, maybe shut it off and go away and watch it and then come <laughs> back later. Um uh, Pete, let, let me start with a couple of questions, though. Um, do you remember where you first or where you initially began to develop your love of the Western? Do you remember, do you remember what it was that got you fascinated with them? It was my family, definitely. <clears throat> so, yeah, my dad was big into Westerns and my grandpa um, on my dad's side liked Westerns. He used to sing a lot of Western songs to me when I was a kid and and then just studying, you know, as, as that, that was where it started, but studying my family history and stuff made it more, even more interesting to me. Um, but definitely dad and grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, that would be me as well. Particularly my father. My, my grandfather was a, um, a, a dairy farmer from up in the North Island. And, and I, early on in my life, I have very few memories of him because they were living still in the North Island. You know, it's quite a wee... Uh, well, a couple of thousand kilometers away from where we are, uh, where we were, grew up in the South Island. And, um, but my dad in particular, and uh, it, it, it's, it really was, it was a sort of, there was John Wayne in particular was a regular staple. And yeah. you know, the Duke was, it was, it was, it was a family favorite, particularly for dad. And, um, and, and a lot of it was his childhood too. So he, he'd tell you, I remember a lot of his stories about going to see the matinees and the movies and a lot of them were Westerns. It was, it was just the, you know, the, probably the movie of choice for a lot of people when he was growing up. So definitely from that generation, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And it's funny you should talk about music because we'll, we'll talk about this as we go into some of my top tens and some of my honourable mentions. But um, for me, like uh, Marty Robbins and Frankie Lane, Frankie Lane in particular, sang a couple of theme songs for westerns, and 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 I've still like they're in my vinyl collection. In fact, I I inherited my father's vinyls when he passed away a couple of years ago. And I still have the original Marty Robbins Gunfighter Ballads and um, Frankie Lane's Hell Bent for Leather. Even, even if you haven't watched many westerns, if you watch the Blues Brothers, you will you will know at least one track off it. You'll know yeah. right. <laughs> and, um, well, and, you, it's, um, and it's and it's it's the original uh, album that that my dad had, and we still play it. Have you have you got the Marty Robbins song When the Work's All Done This Fall? Yes. Yeah, I got it. So few that's one. Gr- Grandpa used to sing that one all the time to me. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, you, his man, and those guys, they could sing, man. Um, my 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 father. Um, this is a bit of a side tangent, but for my dad, he really loved the Marty's uh, the Marty Robbins song. Um, um, uh, yeah, um, the Master's Call, and it, oh. it's tell, you tell the story about the guy who who's about to die when the cattle stampedes, and then the lightning makes the cross in the tree, and the cattle move around him. And my dad said that was his life because he'd he'd been a, had a pretty rough rough a pretty rough upbringing and, and sort of growing up and, and and some pretty rough things particularly through his um older adolescence and early 20s and he really identified with that because he had a bit of a conversion later on um you know so yeah, yeah. um well one other question before we jump into our top 10 um what do you reckon it is I, I i've noticed a lot of blokes in particular i don't know a lot of females that that are really drawn to westerns i know females that like certain western films but it seems blokes in particular really love and are drawn to westerns. What, what what do you reckon that is? We could spend a whole show on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, well, when we did our last, the last time I was on your show, I talked about a life with meaning or a life with purpose, and I really like you know Victor Frankel. I, I mm-hmm. talked about him and. 
he has a quote. I can't remember word for word, but it's it's something to the effect of what. What man doesn't need is a tensionless state, but instead some goal worthy of striving for. Yeah. And Western movies tend to uh, be, even if they don't, you know, they, there's a lot of romanticism in Western movies that was not how the West was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no. But but even the ones that are more accurate have that element of man against nature, you know, um, man I am, I am here. I stand here. So I am, I exist. I, I can stand against these things. And then there's a lot of themes of, of good and evil. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of themes of, of winning a girl's heart. Yeah. And as much as, as, as our current woke culture, that's complete horse crap, um, <laughs> wants to think those things don't matter and that those things are sort of arbitrary and, and subjective there, we know as believers they're not yeah you know there is good and evil and there is a sense of justice in people and there is a sense of being able to stand and say i did this or i got through this or or i was i passed the test i was tested and and there's a there's an element of guys you know if guys are being honest they want to win a girl's heart they don't they don't want to just settle for someone who settles for them you know yeah. And so I think there's some things that appeal to guys there. I think girls that like Westerns generally like them because there's horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about it, right? It, it really, it's funny. But my uh, wife likes Westerns, but she, yeah, but I don't know if she'd list them as her top, top movie, but she likes series like Heartland and she likes Longmire oh, yeah. and, yeah. you know, stuff like that, so... Yeah, it's um, it's funny, isn't it? The difference there. I, I think probably virtue is a big factor in a lot of westerns, and things like yeah. cur courage. Uh, the hero's journey is very much a story and self sacrifice, you know. Um, and I think really too the themes of justice. Justice is a really common theme in mm -hmm. westerns, and and often defense of the vulnerable is another thing that keeps coming up. And I think that yeah. a lot of blokes that appeals to us, you know. Well, and I think there's a brotherhood thing too, that, and that certainly comes up in some of my on my list of, yeah. of friend, loyal friendship, you know. Yeah. And and I mean, as a social worker, I could say, you know, looking at society, mm -hmm. every time someone asks me what do our teenagers need or what do people need the most of, it's authentic friendship, yeah. authentic relationships. Yeah, and we yeah. don't have them. Well, it's also too that because you'd know this. You, you're you're a man from Boise, Idaho. And and you you well, no no wait I'm not from Boise. Oh, sorry, <laughs> you live in I'm Boise, from, Idaho. I'm from Southern Idaho. I'm from I'm originally from Kimberly. I hate Boise. <laughs> <laughs> Those are fighting words around here. So they're, they're, too many um, liberals. <laughs> so um, but but the the point is you got the wilderness around you, and there's that whole thing too in westerns of the untamed frontier, right? And the the man versus wild, like you've said, that the the element of you know, us versus the elements. It's uh. There's something, yeah. something about that. Um, with that in mind, let's jump into our top 10. We, we were debating before we started recording, what were we going to do? Top 10 or honorable mentions first? We decided let's start with our top 10 and we're going to go one for one, starting from 10, working down to one. So Pete, you're our guest. What is your number 10 on your top 10 Western list? <laughs> All right. So my number 10 is a tie. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a good start already. <laughs> no, I have, I have a couple ties and, yeah. and you'll, you'll understand why. Okay. Yeah. And so the, the, my number 10 is a tie B and it's, it's got the only really two movies on my top 10 that are more kind of geared towards when I was a kid, like being a kid. Yeah. yeah. And it's a tie between the legend of the Lone Ranger and the oh. Lone Ranger. Oh, that's good. Well, what a classic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I loved the Lone Ranger growing up and that legend of the Lone Ranger movie with Christopher Lloyd as Butch Cavendish is a great film. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and then I loved the, the, the recent one from a few years back that Johnny Depp was in. Yeah. My kids love that one it. too, by the way. They absolutely love yeah. that film. So there's, there's good themes in that too. You know, I mean, the Lone Ranger was one of the, I mean, if you go back into the 60s, that was one of the first films that started to look at how the Native Americans were treated. Yeah. 
you know, and it was honest, kind of honest about it. And yeah. a lot of the Westerns don't address that or they portray him, you know, the Native Americans as savages. And, yeah. but the Lone Ranger, you know, even though it was a kid's matinee kind of deal way back in the day, it was the first one that portrayed Native Americans very differently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, which is interesting. That's a theme in my number 10. So my number 10 is The Searchers from 1956. Oh. And and what's interesting about this film is um, I love the cinematography in it. That that opening shot of um, for those who've seen it and remember where it starts in the doorway of the cabin going out into the wilderness and then it ends in that same shot. And there's lots of different bits of cinematography that are really great throughout it. The wilderness is almost like another character in it. Um, directed by the great John Ford and John Wayne as as the as the main character Ethan Edwards. Ooh. And he's this guy who's come back from the war who actually hates Indians. But it's yeah. And in this film, they actually portray and they show you the the perspective of the Indian tribesmen and the tribal elders and what they're actually having to endure. And it's it's actually quite fascinating as a film. Um, and that's one of the hallmarks of this movie. What's interesting, too, about this film is it is consistently ranked in the top 100 movies of all time, and not just Westerns, yeah. but movies. And it's always ranked in the top 10, usually, of yep. Westerns. Yeah, yeah, in fact, I think um, I've read a lot of um, critics who say that, that it's considered, including by them, to be one of the best American Westerns ever made. Like that, They say this is... Good. You know, I, I really like it. I, mm. I think that it, you know, I remember the first time I saw it as a kid mm. and it was frustrating. Yeah. I found it very frustrating as a kid to watch that film because I, 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 it was probably one of the first Westerns where the, the good guys don't really win. No. You know, no one really wins in that film. Yeah. Um, but it was very frustrating. They couldn't find the girls. They couldn't find the girls. And, you know, John Wayne, clearly there's a lot of bigotry in his character yeah. towards towards Native Americans. And and you're trying hard to hate the Native Americans as a little kid because, you you know, all the other <laughs> Westerns, it was cowboys and Indians. And, and you're sitting here going, well, I don't get it. Like, by the end of the movie, I remember going, well, the, the Native Americans don't look like bad folks. Why, no. You know, like kind of what's going on here? But but if the if you read the book, too, you know, the book, they're pretty graphic about how the Native Americans treated settlers. And so yeah. at the beginning of the book, you're furious. By the end of the book, you're sort of like, what do I do? <laughs> what, you know, where do I stand on this? Well, well, it, it's it's it also portrays. There's an interesting moment in the film where they go to rescue one of the. the, the one thing that's interesting about this film in general is the the time, the way time is portrayed. You 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 you've got to keep an eye on things because all of a sudden you've jumped ahead a few months or weeks, and you, it, it's not like filmmaking today where they tell you quite clearly that's happened. And so, um, it's quite it's actually over a period of quite some time, and by the end. John Wayne, our hero, has become the villain, right? He's lived long enough that they want to hunt him down and arrest him for his crimes at the very end. Remember the wedding scene? And um, but, but the interesting thing is they come to rescue one of the young women and she doesn't want to leave. Yeah, she doesn't and, want to go yeah, back. Yeah, and apparently that, that did happen with some settlers in some tribes, not all, but some tribes. Like, wasn't, it, wasn't it Roanoke? Roanoke, they think that they um, one of the friendly tribes uh, assimilated to protect the the um the what would you call them the pioneers who were left on that island right that and and the, the more um aggressive hostile tribes would have attacked and killed them otherwise and so yeah. um so yeah apparently that did happen and they would go to get these people and they'd say no I'd rather stay here with this community of Native Americans because it's got everything I need and what I want so yeah you know um one yeah. one other fun fact before we go to number nine was this was the first film ever apparently to have a making of documentary made about it. So making of documentaries about movies were never a thing. And it was John Ford, the director, who asked for this. He said, I want all this footage shot behind the scenes and all that sort of stuff. And he was the first one to actually actually do that. So in a lot of ways, a real pioneering film. Um, number nine. What's your number nine, Pete? All right. <clears throat> number nine is is a Duke movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a yep. picture of John Wayne in my office at work. And I, I yeah. love John Wayne's movies. Um but my number nine is 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 one of them, it's my it's probably my second favorite John Wayne film, but it it wasn't it doesn't it's got to be at nine. It can't be or it can't be later. It's Big yeah. Jake. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Big Jake. Um, I think it's a great film. It's it's um it's sort of a happy ending, but it's I mean you know it, it it's not a totally happy ending. I mean his best friend the Indian gets killed. Yeah, 
you know, and they go after the, you know, these, they go to take this money, this ransom money to, to pay for his grandson who's kidnapped. Um, but there's some great, like, the, the, you know, it was like, there's some great one-liners and speeches and stuff in it that, that just make it the kind of Western that appeals to guys, you know, <laughs> and, and, and there's some real subtle stuff in it too. You know, some people gave John Wayne a hard time about being really basic and superficial in his acting, but there's some real subtle stuff in this film. One, when Maureen O'Hara finds him to get him to, to be the guy to take the money. And he says, you know, do, do we, I mean, do you have a million dollars? And she says, yes. And many times that, and they put the trunk up there yeah. and he opens it up and he glances down and you see this change on his face. Yeah. And, and then he looks at her and he, and he goes, this the way you want it, <laughs> you know? And she says, yeah, these are dangerous men. And I think we should give them exactly what they've asked for. Yeah. And you don't come to find out till later, there was no money in that box. <laughs> you know, from the beginning, she got yeah. her ex-husband to go get these guys and kill them, you know? Yeah. And I, I, you know, you miss that if you're not really paying attention to what's going on. And then of course the end, when he gets to kind of give his version of a speech to the bad guy, his lecture, when he says, now you listen, you know, anything happens, anything goes wrong. I'm going to blow your head off. <laughs> I don't care who else gets hurt. I don't care who else dies. I'm going to blow your head off, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, when he says that's the stuff dreams are made of when he opens up the box and it's newspaper, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's some really, I, it's a great film. It, it's, it's, it's a kind of a formula film, um, mm -hmm. but it's definitely one of my favorite, you know, his son plays in it. Robert Mitchum plays in it. Um, it, it uh, it's not, it's my number nine. Oh, that's uh, not a bad pick. Um, for me, my number nine, I've got a few modern Westerns, what some call neo-Westerns on here. Um, but for me, I, I've gone a little bit um, a little bit left field with my number nine, and it's the 2011 animated film Rango. And uh, mm. I, I really love Rango. So Johnny Depp in this one is the main character. He plays a, a, a chameleon called, well, who becomes Rango. He reinvents himself as Rango. It's such a bizarre thing because it doesn't really start as a Western. He's in the back of the family um, station wagon. They're going, I think they're moving or going on holiday or something. And he's a, he's a chameleon. He's in his little nice, safe little uh, aquarium tank thing. And it gets spilled out of the car and smashed onto the road. And he ends up in the desert. And he ends up in this town with these other animals, these other creatures. And then from there, the Western kicks off. And you've got the villains and the bad guys. And there's even a, 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 um, a homage to, um, to um, what's his name? Uh, Clint Eastwood. And uh, there's a guy in a golf cart who's basically Clint Eastwood, played by Timothy Oliphant, um, who does yeah. the voice. Um, Gore Verbinski, who did the Pirates of the Caribbean stuff, so it's a little bit sort of quirky. Um, the visuals are absolutely stunning. And speaking of, this is my first uh, reference to music. There is a brief appearance of the song Water uh, by, by sung by, I remember the Frankie Lane version, and actually, but a few mm -hmm. singers did a version of that song, including Marty Robbins as well, actually. But um, but yeah, there's a there's a brief and and that took me back to my childhood. And I just there's something about that film. It captures so many of the tropes you'd say, of of westerns from a bygone mm -hmm. era. The music, the the way the villains are, the way the good guys are, the way they speak, the 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 challenge that's before them. The you know, or it, it's there's just something about it. It's a it's a very um, uh, it's not adult as in um, uh, particularly um, the content, but it's a, it's more adult and, and, and sort of it's a deeper, darker sort of themes that it touches on uh, in the skin of a, of a kid's animated movie. But it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah, for me, I really love that film. Yeah, I've seen it. I don't remember it very well, but I never would have thought to put it on a Western list. But <laughs> I, I know that. And that, well, honestly, I quibbled over this one. But it was, the, it was yeah. the only one that was sort of a bit out of left field. I thought, no, I, I do. I really love... There's something about it. It just captures the imagination of, of um, yeah. There's there's so many. Um, you know, it's it's like when you see a, a film with Bruce Dern in it. You mm -hmm. know, and you know, it's it's that kind of a thing where you're like, oh yeah, you know, that that takes me back to another time and another moment. He's just sort of he's a guy that keeps appearing in these t sorts of films. Or you see John Wayne in a film. You know, it has a it has a sort of almost like a a mystical emotional quality to it. It's it's yeah, you know definitely. So what about you? Your number eight. What's your number eight? All right, so now I'll, I'll reference music. Um, <laughs> this film is good. I, I'm not going to, you know, it's a good film. It's, but I'll tell you, the, the reason it got on my 
my top 10 list has to do with its influence with with its soundtrack and that's the good the bad and the ugly ah uh, yeah yeah good cool so probably the best composition for any western ever yeah. ever made you know and it there's some interesting themes in it but it's very much uh you know two bad guys and one kind of bad guy all going <laughs> after money yeah. so it's not real not a whole lot of honor in this movie you know i mean not. but but the soundtrack's amazing and and i really believe quentin tarantino was probably a fan of sergio leone's directing because there's a lot of silence and mm. body language in sergio leone leone's stuff you know i mean they'll their characters will sit and stare at each other for three minutes before yeah. something happens and there's all these other things going on and tensions building and and I think that that movie does a really good job of using those tools without having to resort to the stuff that movies do today to build tension. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's a great film and it is a, considered a classic, rightly so. Of course, it's got the other great favorite in our house, which was Clint Eastwood. Um, but and, and that famous theme song that just every you just play that that track. Um, uh, Morricone, isn't it? Um, Enrico and uh, Morricone's famous soundtrack. And you play that the whistling. Everyone knows what that oh, is yeah. It, yeah. it's but it, it's interesting too that it's um uh it's for me this was a film i was so torn about it didn't make it into my top 10 but it was one that was just outside it, it it's in my honorable mentions but uh, for it, it was really came down to that my dad was a big clint eastwood fan i like clint eastwood and i like his films particularly the films he's made but he's not he's not like if i was going to say who's your go-to action or sort of western star it wasn't for me Clint Eastwood, just a, you know, so just for that reason alone, I had to push something out. And that, 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 yeah. that. <laughs> what's um, yours? Well, my number eight, again, it's modern, um, and it's the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, two thousand and seven oh. film. Um, a, a, funnily enough, directed by a Kiwi, born here in New Zealand, Andrew Dominic, um, Brad Pitt and Casey Affleck are in it, and it's also based on the novel of the same name by Ron Hansen, who's a Catholic, very Catholic man and a Catholic author. If you haven't read any Ron Hansen stuff, you should. He's written a lot of really good stuff. Um, and the soundtrack by Nick Cave and Warren Ellis was kind of different for what you'd see in a, in a Western film. The visuals are stunning. There's just, you know, the visual, yeah, the visual imagery in that movie is great. Yeah, yeah and, and, and this is, for me, one of, I think, the, the, the greatest cinematographers ever and certainly working and alive today, Roger Deakins, who did that film 1917 about the, the the two soldiers in World War One that came out recently? He did Skyfall, the James Bond film. Um, he does he's done uh, he's worked a lot with Denis Villeneuve. So he did the new Blade Runner. He did Sicario. So he he uses a lot of natural light and a lot of um, so you you know you have candles without artificial lights. You know he film at night with just a candle and things like that. And so you get a lot of that sort of cinematography in it. And the storytelling for me is just so cap captivating. Like I normally hate monologues you know when you got a narrator narrating but this one it worked it just worked where they had that narration and it's it because it's 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 written in the old sort of style that probably someone mm -hmm. writing back then would have written and so it's yeah it reminds me way, of you know? like if they if they were like if the if the guys making movies back then had what we have now that's what a movie would yeah. look like yeah that's what i think of when i yeah yeah, and I think too for me, um, maybe it's a bit of an arm's length thing as well. My dad, we grew up, we knew the the legend of Jesse James. We just knew that story. And it was I, I, it's obviously something that dad really, um, I think he was one of those kids. Well, in fact, I know he was. He used to read the cowboy comic books under the under the covers at night. He, he's like, he was one of those kind of kids. And he knew the story of the James brothers, the James gang, Jesse James in particular. I remember very young as a kid, he would tell us about, we knew how he'd been shot in the back of the head, putting up a painting. We knew all that as New Zealanders. It was so bizarre. And I know over there, Jesse James has a very different sort of iconography. So we're a bit removed. But one of the things I liked about this film was that it actually sort of gave a bit more of a complex take on it, how Jesse James, his flaws were also on display. And you sort of felt sorry for Robert Ford as well. You know, and 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 you realise it wouldn't have actually been that glamorous to be part of a criminal enterprise like that. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, that there would have been actually quite violent and rough men. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's how you survived. So, yep. Uh, number seven. What's your number seven? All right, this is my second tie. Uh, <laughs> but you'll understand. So, the first one is is what I would call more of a modern western, although it's at this point twenty something years old. 
Um, and, and then it's tied with an older Western and they're both about the same event, but you really can't have one without the other, even though they're very different takes on it. Yeah. And that's a tie between Tombstone and the gunfight at the OK Corral. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah. Good so, choice. I mean, Tombstone was a great film. You know, historically it had problems like most films do, but it was actually closer to, to the way yeah. things went down at the OK Corral than the movie The Gunfight at the OK Corral was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Tombstone had one of my, couple of my favorite actors. I mean, it had Kurt Russell, who I really like, and it had Val Kilmer, who I really like. Yeah. Um, As Doc Holliday, he was great, eh? Too, but, what's that? As Doc Holliday, he was great, Val Kilmer. Oh, he was fantastic, yeah. 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 Uh, it is, it, there's a lot of cool stuff in there, the theme of friendship, the theme of loyalty, you know, things like that. And even the theme of limitations, probably my my favorite part of the film, even though this didn't happen historically, Doc Holliday did not kill Johnny Ringo. But yeah. um, but when Kurt Russell is talking to Doc Holliday, you know, why he says, I can't beat him, can I? And, you know, Val Kramer says, no, you can't. Yeah. You know, and, and he says, all right. And so why? And he goes, well, because he's just that he's that bad of a man. You know, he yeah, explains yeah. why he's such a bad person. And then, you know, Doc Holliday goes and, and kills him. And so that didn't really happen in history. But but in the movie, they, I really like that, the way they play that. Um, and then the gunfight at the OK Corral, I won't say too much about that. It's an old film, but um, but Kurt Douglas is in it. And yep. and and I really like Kurt Douglas. I, I think he's a great actor. And I don't, I mean, I know he's had a lot of accolades, but I don't I don't think he's had enough accolades. He was such a versatile <laughs> actor. And, yeah. uh, you know, so... <laughs> I, I just really got into that movie and um, as well. and uh, But again, it's the event that causes the tie. Yeah. I think I like Tombstone better, but you, I can't include, I can't say Tombstone and not have Gunfight at the OK Corral yeah. in there. Yeah, know? that's good. Funny, because both of those are on my um, honorable mentions. The Gunfight at OK Corral almost made it into the top 10. It was so tight. And for me, uh, that's one I remember as a kid. It's got a Frankie Lane song in it. Frankie Lane yep. singing Gunfight at OK Corral, which yep. everyone knows in our house. Um, and I recently watched this actually, or rewatched it, sorry, with my son. And he loved it. He absolutely loved it. It, it just, um, it held up for him. And it, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pretty solid film. And I think one thing that's great about um, the Gunfight at OK Corral is that you, like, you can't show Tombstone to a younger kid. It's just, it's a little bit of content that they're not quite ready for. But Gunfight yeah. at OK Corral, you can, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's got that element of that older western where it's pretty pure, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. virtuous movie. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Doc Holliday's Doc Holliday's a lot better than he probably was in real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's. Did you? What about? Did you? Has Wired Earth made it anywhere on your list or not? Yeah, see, I, I put that in my honorables again for the same reason as you. It's sort of I see it almost like a a, um, a trinity of films when I add Wired Earp into that mix of of Tombstone. I didn't think Wired Earp was great of a film. You no, know? it's okay, but I I liked where it, that that the elements of um of Tombstone are in there, but there's a whole lot of other stuff I think. And Kevin Costner it was it felt a little bit like um oh yeah, let's get that guy who's really big at the moment and we'll get him to play yeah. Wired Earp. You know, had that had that going on. Um, my number seven. Well, my, again, maybe like you a little bit. I, I, I've got a blast from the past and a um, and a future. That's the same version of the same film, and it's three ten to Yuma. Now, oh, okay. the one the one that's made it into my number seven is the original nineteen fifty seven film. For me, that's the one I grew up with. It's the one I love. It still holds up. I watched this again recently with my kids, and although the girls were a little bit like, "Oh, Dad, this is not that good," my son loved it. Um, and there's so much going on in this movie. So there's some beautiful cinematography, all black and white. But you, there's a beautiful scene in the opening there with Ben Wade, who's the villain. Mm -hmm. Now, and the new one you remember in uh, was it 2007? It's played by Russell Crowe. And and, yep. and but in the original one, um, the villain uh, Ben Wade is there in black and white with the girl behind the bar when they've just robbed the stagecoach. And there's this beautiful um, side by side of of their faces. Uh, they're not actually standing side by side, but they're put together side by side by the director. And this sort of beautiful cinematography to show the the sort of the the relationship and everything else. It's quite beautiful. Um, there's some baptismal imagery at the end. The, the you know almost like Shawshank Redemption, a guy getting washed at the end. Um, Frankie Lane. 310 to Yuma. I love that song. And of course, it's in the original, not the new one. 
uh, based on an Elmore Leonard story. And um, and what's uh, a couple of interesting to- uh, crossovers here? I'm uh, Shane, which made it onto my honourable mentions list, um, is uh, stars um, what's his name um, Van Heflin, and Van Heflin played uh, played the dad um, mm-hmm. Joe is it Joe Starrett and 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 Shane he plays Dan Evans, the the, the father in this one as well. And um, what I love about this is is and I think particularly the the new version with um, Christian Bale playing Dan Evans is that they really capture the essence of this father who's a man of virtue, who knows he must do the right thing. And even when everyone else abandons him, they offer him money to walk away, he he still doesn't do that. He does he does the right thing because that is the right thing that must be done. And especially you get that sense, his son looking up to him as well, that he must show his son what an mm-hmm. honourable man does, even if he's alone. I, I, there's so much in that film I really love. Yeah. Well, that's it's on my honourable mention list mm. too. Uh, 310 to Yuma is on my honorable mention list and it's um, both of them. Yep. And I think the second one, I mean, the first one's really good. I like first one. I think the second one reinforces that theme a little bit better of you, you do what you say you're going to do yeah. and you, and you do the right thing regardless of what everybody else says or, or what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And if you can die with that, then you've probably done something, you yeah. know, and, and that, that's, it's, I don't know. I agree. It, it didn't make my top 10, but it is on my honorable mention list. Yeah. Th- there's another one we'll get to on my top 10, which also covers a similar sort of thing. You know, the man alone against um, the villain when everyone else has abandoned him. And it's very much in that era where, you know, the whole McCarthyism was starting to come into force and they were sort of, uh, you know, there was a, there was almost a witch trial element around uh, Hollywood at the time. And yeah, so there's a definitely a reflection of that sort of era as well, but it also holds up because it's, these are natural law truths, you know, about yeah. virtue and goodness and courage and stuff. So, Definitely. Um, number six for you. What's your number six, mate? All right. So number six is 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 probably one of my top two fav top two or three <laughs> favorite westerns. Yeah. But it's 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 not good enough to be at number one for best western ever. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, it, 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 I mean the cat. It, it's the cowboys. Yeah. Oh, good On, choice. Cowboys. So you've got Bruce Dern, you know, as the villain. <laughs> you've got amazing support actor in uh, Roscoe Lee Brown yeah. as the the cook. Yeah. Um, it's it's a coming of age kind of film. It's a dealing with death kind of film. John Wayne dies. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't have a happy ending per se. You know? Well, it's in it's in the, it's in that era, right? It's early seventies, isn't it? When they they yeah. starting to make those sort of a bit more um, gritty, darker sort of. A lot of cinema was like that. that well, and and to get to my into my top six or five, it's it's, it's not going to generally have a happy ending. <laughs> uh, I I I didn't put any movies in there that romanticize the West. You know, to get into my top ones, you got that's got to be realistic about what the West was like, and yeah. And I think the Cowboys is close. I mean, you know, I don't think a bunch of kids are going to outsmart a bunch of, of dangerous outlaws, but but that's the movie part. But then the dealing with death and John Wayne, you know, lost his sons and, you know, and so he, now he has a second chance with all these kids. And yeah, I, I don't know. There's, there's just, I really like the film. I, I love yeah. the film. And I think my favorite, li- I, there's some great lines in the film. Yeah. You remember actors and cinematography. I remember lines, you know. <laughs> and I love it when when Bruce Stern says, "Do I look like the kind of man that would beat on an innocent boy?" And John Wayne says, "You look like the vermin-ridden son of a bitch that you are." <laughs> I love that line, you know. Oh, man. And I also like when uh, they're gonna hang Roscoe Lee Brown, and he he's praying, and he goes, "Above all." Forgive me for those men I've killed in anger and for those I'm about to. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. There's some greats. And it was I think Slim Pickens, was he? He was in that film, wasn't he? Slim, Slim Pickens, Pickens was, was in there, there as yeah. very, a very young Slim Pick, yeah. It's, it's um, sort of qu- quintessential Western. In, 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 yeah. Oh, it's a there. great film. It's a great yeah. film. Um, well, my number six, interestingly, I've gone a little bit off the reservation here. And... Um, this was a recent discovery, well, recent, um, probably four or five years ago, but it's it's a, f- a film from 2014, so it's very new, uh, definitely a more modern Western. It's called The Dark Valley, 
It's originally in German or Austrian. It was called Das Finsteretal, which is the Dark Valley. And it's um, directed by a guy called um, uh, Austrian filmmaker. I'll, I'll say his name here. I've got it written down in front of me. Andreas Prochaska. And uh, he's done a couple other films, but this was sort of one of his bigger ones. Sam Riley, who's the English actor and it, plays the main character, Greta. And it's set in the Austrian Alps, but it is a Western. It really is a Western, trust me. It's it's not a it's not anything else. It's set in the Austrian Alps, and there's this main character who arrives in town, and clearly something's not right about this town. Something is absolutely not right. So it's it's got a, almost like a horror sinister element because they're sort of up in the snowy Alps, away from everyone else, and they're almost like a culty commune. You got that vibe going on, and um and he's the stranger. They don't want him in town. They want him gone. And then you discover as the story unfolds, and I won't spoil it. It's a dark film, by the way. It's not a, it's a it's, you talk about ha- uh, gritty and unhappy. This is not a happy film. It is a very much a revenge, or you might say justice, with a little bit too much justice involved um, a, a theme in this one. But you realize he's the son of someone in the town who was wronged by this little, they became like a, almost like a religious cult in this town, this old Western style town. And, and um, it's set in the Austrian Alps, but you really, you, you kind of know it because they're speaking the Austrian, but it is very much the, the dress, the horses, everything. It's, it's a, it is very much a Western. It's, it's, um, and, and yeah, it's, um, it's, so it's newer. So it's a bit more brutal, and a bit more violent, but the, the cinematography is amazing. I, I really liked the story. There was just, I'll have I don't to know, watch it. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's, it's hard to find too. I've been wanting to purchase it on Amazon on, I, uh, sorry, on iTunes and they just don't have it available, but I believe Amazon in some countries, but I can't even get it in New Zealand. I think I watched it on Netflix a few years back, but um, but yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd quite liked it. So there you go. That, that's me. What about number five? Uh, number five. Okay, so now we're getting into the top five here. <laughs> yeah. this was, oh, this I should, was sorry. I should say, by the way, folks, when Pete and I first discussed this show, it was going to be our top five westerns, but it was just impossible. And even our honorable mentions, we've got more honorable mentions than we have top ten. So, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. This, so I spent a lot of time thinking about my list, and, and I had to put some films outside my top five that I really like, like the Cowboys, you know, yeah. and Big Jake and stuff, because I just didn't think they were they had everything they needed to be in that top five. And so my number five for me is Hang 'em High with Clint Eastwood. Oh, classic. Good choice. So you talk about justice and the law mm-hmm. and how the law is supposed to be blind yeah. And, you know, so there's all these themes in there. These guys hang him and he wasn't guilty of anything. Um, and this is at a time in the country, you know, when people would hang people. I mean, that happened in the Old West. And you wonder how many times they got it wrong, you know. <laughs> or, um, And, you know, so he's the, he goes as a marshal to go track him down. And some of them, you know, you feel kind of sorry for him. But the judge is like, no, you know, they broke the law. And, yeah. And. And then Clint Eastwood starts to develop sort of this in, indignate, this moral indignation kind of with the judge's style and is going to quit at the end. And the judge says, yeah, you go ahead and quit. But here's the deal. Right now, the only thing that stands between good and evil in this territory is me yeah. and my marshals. And so you can judge me for how I act and how I decide things, but you're not really in a position to do that. Now, when this becomes a state and we have all these other things, well, that's fine. But right now, if people like us don't stand up and, and, and enforce the law, then yeah, there is no law. Yeah, there's a sort of sense too, isn't there, of, of um, it's almost like uh, Dirty Harry in the West, in a sense. I, I, you almost get that sort of, that, that this is one of those films, I think, that really cements Clint Eastwood's reputation and that sort of as the hard-nosed lawman. You know, that Dirty Harry very much carried on, you know? Yeah, I think, I think in this, maybe initially, but he starts to have, he starts to have issues later. Yeah. You know, he starts to second guess, I think, some of it. Mm. But I think he totally, you know, chan- I don't, you know, Dirty Harry came later and, mm. and I think he totally was channeling his Hang 'em High character in his Dirty Harry confrontation, oh, yeah. Yeah. especially that first one when he's like, when you hang a man, you better look at him. You know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's some, yeah, but, but there's some, there's some deep stuff in that, in that film, you know, and, 
And then the fact, something that some people miss is they like, he, he's kind of falling in love with this lady who was raped. Mm. And, but yet then he's questioning like the reach of the law. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, it's just, it's complex. It's way more complex than just a formula Western, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and Eastwood was doing that a bit around that time. Eh? I remember in our house, that was a bit of a favorite of my dad. So he would have approved of that being in your top five. Um, I remember um, things like Pale Rider as well. They were starting to get a bit more complex, that sort of 70s period of Westerns. They were they were exploring some of the deeper themes around human nature and the characters weren't as clean cut. You know, it wasn't the black and white. You know, the the, the good guys are, are, are white, the, 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 the bad guys black are hat dark. And white hat. Yeah, yeah, really. It was starting to change a lot, wasn't it, around that period? Yeah. Um, my number five is, a, is a, again, what um, some have called a, a neo-Western crime film. So it's a new one from 2016. It's Hell or High Water. And mm. uh, Hell or High Water is great. And it doesn't appear on the surface to be a Western, but it, it really absolutely is. Directed by David McKenzie, written by Taylor Sheridan. Now, Taylor Sheridan originally started as an actor and then he started writing. And I think he was in The Wire, actually, as an actor first. That was his first acting gig. He wrote Sicario. Uh, he wrote um, another one that made it into my um, my honourable mentions, which I'll tell you about in a minute. He wrote this one, Hell or High Water. Uh, he wrote, for those who have seen the TV series Yellowstone with Kevin Costner, it's, it's, which I really love, he, he, that, he wrote that. Um, and um, it, it's just a great film. Chris Pine and Ben Foster. Ben Foster was in the remake of 310 to Yuma. He was the the second in command to Ben Wade, to Russell Crowe's character. And so the, uh, Chris Pine and Ben Foster are two brothers, and it starts with them robbing banks. Jeff Bridges is the Texas Ranger, and he's also got a fellow Texas Ranger who's an Indian, and they have this whole, it's quite racist actually, banter back and forth. Um, but they're really good comrades, and, and they're, they're, they're hunting down these two brothers who are robbing banks. And it, it starts out at the beginning, and you think this is a typical sort of crime film. They're bank robbers. They're just young Louts, probably on the what well, you know the hillbilly heroine, the oxycontin or whatever, and and because it's set in the modern times, and you think they deserve everything that's coming, and then you discover as the film progresses why they are robbing these banks, and you realise no, in actual fact, they are the ones who are in the right in this, and it's it's actually quite a it's it's a really good film, really it is. really. It's good hard film. to talk about it without spoiling. Yeah, and I don't want to do that too much if I can yeah. help it, but it is a great film, eh? Yeah, that's 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 a good. It is. It's a good film. I wouldn't have thought of it for this, but I could see why. Yeah, I could see how it cl classifies as a western, definitely. Yeah, and for me, it's interesting. You really, I think one of the big things that really flags that because uh, several of my top five are more modern western or neo westerns, they call them. But um, this film in particular, it's really, I think the the Jeff Bridges is the lawman. It, there's something about that element as well that's there, and there's this bank robbery, and there's you know it's. It, yeah, it, it's it's interesting, eh? and it, and what it does, is it really is very character driven too. It's about these men and their motivations, mm -hmm. um, you know, and good and good and evil and all that sort of stuff. Um, Pete, for you, number four. What's your number four? All right, well, here we're, we're getting close down to the wire here. Uh, <laughs> number four is sort of a tie, but not really. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of a pick, but it's it's True Grit. Ah, uh, yeah. Which version? And I, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. That, that's what I mean. It's a tie, but it's not like they're both good. I liked them both. Uh, I, I know some people didn't like the new one, but I think the new one is a little, is a little more realistic. Yeah. You know, especially, you know, I mean, there's a couple, they might seem like small things, but when he starts stabbing the horse to get it to go faster, you know, oh, and, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, you people watch that and they're like, oh, my gosh, that's terrible. I go, you, you don't understand the role of animals in the building of the American West. It, they were they, it was there were situations where you died or your animal died. Yeah. And, that you know, um, I, I have I'm friends with a lot of hound hunters and they use hounds to hunt bear and mountain lion and stuff. And it's like, you know, they, they say always say the hardest thing about it is is that there are pets but they're a, they're a tool first yeah you know and so i mean it's just, it's just to me it was a little more realistic and the ending i thought was a little more realistic as well yeah. on the newer one but yeah of course the the original is the only one john wayne got an academy award for yeah. um it has a great ending it's a it's a 
it's a happy ending, but <laughs> when he says, she says, you're far too old and fat to be jumping four rail fences or whatever. And he says, well, come visit an old fat man someday. <laughs> <laughs> Jumps his horse over the fence. You know, I, yeah. they're both good. I mean, you got to love Robert Duvall in the, in the original, you know, and, and yeah. if we forget how old Robert Duvall, you know. Yeah, uh, I know, because he's been around that long. Amazing, yeah, uh, but but the good the new one was good was good i i you know they're both great the story is is timeless in a sense it was a book first and yeah. um so that's my that's my forest true grit you know that's that's good we're going to be talking about that on my list in just a moment as well so we'll come back to that one um for me my number 4 uh, is the 2017 film hostiles and I didn't think I would be a, as big a fan. This is a film that has really grown on me. There is a bit of revisionist history in this film, let's be clear about this, but I like the themes that it tackles. So directed by Scott Cooper, Christian Bale is in it, Rosamund Pike and Wes Studi. Uh, Wes Studi is, for a long time has been the sort of Hollywood go-to actor when you want an Indian in a film. Um, um, and, but he is, he's a very, very good actor. Um, and so Wes Studi plays this... Um, uh, aging Indian chief who's dying of cancer. And um, Christian Bale is this US Army cavalry officer who's been told, you've got to escort this um, Cheyenne war chief who he's previously been an enemy with. You've got to take him back to his family and to the homeland so he can die there in uh, Montana, I think it is, isn't it? And uh, he doesn't, they start out with this absolute animosity. And Christian Bale very much is what you would imagine a very jaded PTSD man who's been involved in acts of genocide would have would have been like and so they they are absolute a a enemies at the beginning um it's got a beautiful score by max richter i love max richter he's a modern composer and his and that really adds to the film and there's some really beautiful themes there's a there's a moment where um she rosamund pikes the main character she loses her family to an indian raid at the start of the film and including a baby who that was in her arms it's, it's pretty sort of you know, in your face opening. Um, and, um, but she ends up on this journey as well. Cause she's got to go back somewhere from the fort where she fled to, to go back to, I think to Montana. And so they, they take her along on the journey and she sort of becomes the, the sort of the gentle feminine conscience that really starts to change and, and, and really eat away at Christian Bale's character. And, um, she, at one point she asks him, do you believe in God? Cause I think he's reading a little new Testament or something. And she he says, he, he, she, she he makes some kind of about suffering in the world, and she has this beautiful thing about um this is the what this is the Lord's rough ways she calls it. Harry forms us through suffering. It's really really beautiful stuff. Um, it, it, it's it, ultimately it's a film about forgiveness and redemption, and and it's it's this character a, a journey that 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 um Christian Bale's character goes on from hatred of a race of people to actually at the end being there. It, it's not soppy. It is not overly sentimental and false he you know he's still a rough guy at the end but he is now a champion for um these indians who and and it's, and you see it as they go on the journey stage by stage so there's the chief there's a i think he's got two daughters and a son with him and all of a sudden stage by so so at first they are chained up tight and then they you know bit by bit the chains come off then they they become like an actual little community it's it's yeah, I, I really love that film. There's just something about it. And I know there's a bit of revisionist history in there. It, it's it's um, perhaps more of a um, hopeful take on things. But, uh, but yeah, I, I like the themes. I think there's, they're really important themes about forgiveness and redemption. You know, Those come up a lot in, in good Westerns and in any good films, I think. Yeah, and it's funny because I never thought it was going to be a, 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 a certainly would have, would have never made it into my top five I, until I saw it actually initially and then I went back and watched it again and just it really grew on me that film and something about it um all right number three for you Pete what's number three we're getting in, we're getting in the business end of the season now so what's number three for you well we've already we've already talked about it my number three is the searchers oh uh, good choice so I just you know I I knew when we decided we were going to do this that the searchers would be in my top five yeah I just wasn't sure where yeah and uh, I think I think that it, I think I got it in the right spot for me, but yeah. we've already talked about it, but there's a lot of complexity in that film. And yeah. And it, like I said, the first time I watched it, I felt frustrated and confused. <laughs> as a kid. And I think that's good. You know, yeah. my favorite children's story is the, was the first story that didn't have an, a happy ending, which was what? Uh, it was a Shel Silverstein book, actually yeah. Lofcadio. Okay. Yeah. So, 
you know, I think that good, good art, good film, good literature, it's got to evoke some, it's got to evoke something in you other than just, you know, everybody lives happily ever after, you know? Yeah. And, and so that's that, you know, the searchers, that's, that's my number three. Definitely. Like I said, we've already, we've already kind of run that one over the coals. So. Yeah, that, it is, it's a good choice. It's a, um, it's funny how we had it in two different places, but uh, yeah, it absolutely is. There's no doubting for me that it's um, when people say that it is a phenomenal and a very important film, it really is. It abs- it's not that's not, it's you know it's right up there in the history of filmmaking. Full stop. So that's a good choice, mate. For me, I'm, again, I've got another neo western crime thriller. <laughs> it's 2007's No Country for Old Men. Oh, great and, film. Yeah, and again, directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen, who we're going to be talking about in a moment, um, with uh, who did the remake of, um, of uh, what were we just talking about? I can't even remember. True Grit. True Grit, that's right. Um, but uh, so Joel and Ethan Cohen, it's based on the Cormac McCarthy novel of the same name. Uh, so, you know, dark and gritty, of course, Cormac McCarthy. Uh, the Road is a phenomenal novel, by the way, if you want to read something over these holidays. Um, so Tommy Lee Jones, um, you know, the older, aging, more philosophical lawman. Javier Bardem, who's the character of Anton Shakur, he's basically the Grim Reaper. He really is. He's even got a bowl cut like the Grim Reaper's hood and everything. This, this, he's unstoppable. Uh, Josh Brolin, who's the cowboy who comes across the stash of money, the drug money that's not his own, and decides as a poor cowboy he's going to keep it and make a better life for him and his wife. Um, this is a film that it really is. It's a phenomenal piece of filmmaking and storytelling. Um, I, I did a bit of research about um, the critical reception and apparently more critics included this film on their 2007 top list than any other film. Many people regard it as the Coen brothers best movie ever. And it is, it is it's in the, uh, it's in the number one spot for the top films of that decade. And, it, 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 and deservedly so. But for me, I just, it's, it's, it is a fresh take on the Western. So you've got those, those elements that you've got the lawmen, you've got the guys who are like almost like privateers who work for the villains as, as, as sort of to hunt down the bounty. You've got a bounty that's on offer. Um, and then you've got this, um, you've got this deeper level as well of the whole question of where is God and suffering and death is very much a theme that's in this film. And this unrelenting character of Anton Shakur who flips a coin and then decides whether he's going to kill you with a cattle gun, an ear-powered cattle gun. So he treats human beings like cattle. He's literally like the Grim Reaper. And, and uh, yeah, it's um, there's just something about that film that, uh, yeah, a pretty pretty amazing film. And and I think rightly so deserves the, the neo-Western um, title. No, I it's a great film. And yeah. I, I actually didn't see it when it first came out. Yeah. Uh, I waited a while before I saw it. And one day I... I don't remember what was going on, but I had nothing to do. And I was like, I need to watch this movie. People have told me about it. And yeah. and I watched it. And I, what I, you know, what I took from that, mm. you know, all the stuff you said I agree with, but I also think there's this whole, where's the line? Yeah. You know, like, you know, when the, Tommy Lee Jones is talking to that other sheriff and, you know, he's, and he's just like, how do we plan for somebody who will come back to the crime scene? That's right. You know, and, and it's just, there's a there's the deterioration of society i think there's a is a major theme in that film that yeah. you know at the beginning tommy lee jones is talking about the old lawmen some who didn't even carry guns yeah and could keep the peace and now you know where but it's like where's the line where do we draw the line there was a when i saw that movie it reminded me of a line in blue bloods in the tv series blue bloods yep when um which is a good series. I really like Tom Selleck, you know, as an actor, but, uh, <laughs> but the grandpa is talking and, and, and they're talking about how, um, things are, be- are different now and you can't do things the way they did in law enforcement before and everything. And they're mad at the grandpa because he's still friends with this ex mobster. And he says, you know, you can, you can talk about how things are different now or how things are better, or whatever else he goes. But, but back when I was in doing this, he goes, everybody knew where the line was and they knew what it cost to cross it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. You know, and that's what reminded me when I saw Old, No Country for Old Men, that's what I thought of. It's like, you know, there's, there's no, there's no line anymore. Yeah. yeah. And, well, well, it's very much, it's, it's an out, it's an outworking too, isn't it? Of that whole idea of um, a culture of nihilism and relativism 
and what happens in that culture that there, there is no virtue and it's just every man for himself yeah okay uh what what about number two for you we're in the we're in the top two now this is you know and for me these were really strong cemented places but gosh it was hard to get the the one yeah two so order for me to make it into my top two you, you mm. it not only had to be fairly realistic mm. it, it it you know it had to it couldn't romanticize things but it also had to be hard to watch. Yep. So even though these are my two top top two in my top two list, I own these movies, I own these films, I love them. But I, I it's as hard for me to watch these films as it is for me to watch Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. All right. You know, I have to like go. Okay, I'm gonna watch it. <laughs> I kind of have to. <laughs> I'm gonna do know, my because, duty. <laughs> yeah they, they just they, they do something in here and they do something in here to me that i just have to go man this is i'm gonna experience a lot of emotions when i watch this film yeah so number two is was was technically a mini series but uh lonesome dove oh yeah what a classic yep so you've got duvall and tommy lee jones great actor i mean they they're magic on the screen together mm. there's a million themes in this in this you know and all whatever it is uh ends up being i think about six hours yeah. i think there are four installments of an hour and a half each so um can i ask but, a question you know, what was it when you were growing up was that on tv i remember as a kid it was. Being broadcast on tv here so mm. so i know that some people are going to go well this is proof that pete's kind of the idaho redneck <laughs> but in my tiny school that i went to where there were 63 of us in the graduating class um, that, that came on when I was in high school and every day at school, we were, we were talking about what happened you know? <laughs> you know? I, for that week. I mean, it was like, yeah. that's what was on our mind. And, um, yeah. but there's a lot of themes in this, you know, I mean, there's the theme of friendship between, um, Augustus and call and mm. they're very different, you know, I mean, they would not be friends if it weren't for the fact they were both Texas Rangers together yeah. at one point. Um, and, you know, call is the hard type A, you know, nonsense, no feelings. And Gus is the just as tough, but, you know, he understands human nature better and is more forgiving and laid back. And, and they sort of switch places, you know, in the course of the film. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of ways. And um, and so you've got this this theme of loyalty and friendship. And then you got these complex things going on where, you know, they build their cattle herd to go north by stealing and they're <laughs> and they're former Texas Rangers and they're stealing from outlaws down in Mexico who stole those cows. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it's it's like, you know, and and. And then you've got the themes of survival going on in so many different ways in that movie. Um, lots of people trying to survive, trying to, to eke out an existence, you know. And, um, and then you've got the theme of justice, this old outlaw that they come across, who they never caught. They, they, they come across him and it's been years since they've encountered him, but they're going to get him because that's what needs to be done. Um, and then one of their good friends goes on the wrong side of the law and they hang him and he was one of their best friends. I mean, it's, and then just the toughness of, of the, I think it does a good job based on what I've studied about the old West is I think it does a good job of showing how tough guys were yeah. that you didn't get a choice. You couldn't go, well, I don't think I want to deal with this. I think I'd rather just go home, you know? And it's just like, no, you don't have an option. You have to deal with it or die. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know, that's, a, yeah. that's that's a good point. I think also too, this is uh, I mean, it's it was a television event. You just don't see those kind of things anymore in that way. No, it, it was. It's it, one of the know. last. It's one of the last that I can remember mm. that was actually like a television event. You know, I mean, yeah. that kind of mm. ended with by the mid '90s. You didn't really see. No, nah, they're all gone, like right? Yeah, yeah, and everyone was watching it together at the same time. Yeah, you know, it was quite his all star cast. I mean, Robert Duvall, mm. Tommy Lee Jones, Robert Ulrich, Ricky Schroeder, Angelica mm. Houston, uh, Steve Buscemi was in that a very young That's Steve right. Buscemi. Right. Um, you know, I I'm trying to think of some of the other names. Like they're not coming to me right now, but 
Um, uh, Danny Danny Glover was in it. Um, he was didn't, Deeds. Did, didn't they do a? Um, wasn't there a Return to Light Some Dove or something? Oh, was it's there a, terrible. And that, yeah, it was awful. I eh? remember they tried to capitalize cash in on it. It it's was terrible. Return to Light Some Dove. The, 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 um, there there is a sequel mm. uh, that that Larry McMurtry wrote um, yeah. called uh, I think it's The Streets of Laredo. That's right. Yeah. Um, good book. Uh, but. You know, it, 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 they they did a they did a prequel too. The Comanche Moon was the prequel, and that wasn't a bad western. Um, it didn't make my honorable mentions though, or my top ten list. But it could have been done a lot better. But the book's fantastic if you're a fan of Lonesome Dove. Comanche Moon is a fantastic book, um, and Streets of Laredo is good. But they're all they're they're not happy endings. I mean, that's they're they're real. They're this is this yeah. is what life is. You know, and yeah. That's good choice. A great, great film. Great good. soundtrack too. Yeah, that's good choice. That's that's an excellent choice. Um, well, my number two is the nineteen fifty two uh, legendary classic High Noon. Oh, um, yeah. You know, uh, directed by uh, Fred uh, Zinnemann, uh, Gary Cooper as Marshall Will Kane, um, the the villainous Frank Miller who he's put in jail previously, and it's, so it's his wedding day, of course. And then uh, news comes that uh, Frank Miller has been released uh, uh, very unjustly and prematurely from prison and that he's planning to get his brothers and the gang together to come and to kill Marshall Will Kane. And so what's interesting about this film is, um, I mean, it is one of the all-time greats of cinema um, and it's definitely that theme. 310 to Yuma, the same sort of theme. This is the one yes, I was talking about. I was you just going to say, same thing. <laughs> you know, man alone. And and even more so, what's interesting I love about this film is that... um. It's actually a married couple, so it's like a family that has to save the world. And what was I remember as a kid watching and just thinking, why won't his friends stay with him? They all started as best mates at the wedding, but they all abandon him as soon as they're afraid for their own lives. They leave him. And what's also interesting is he had a choice. He could have actually left town, but he stays. And there's a sort of sense of a higher virtue, a higher calling you don't ever walk away from. That's sort of it's it's really embedded in that idea. You know, there's there just to interject real quick mm. that there's a I, i'm a big fan of louis lamore books and mm. there's a quote from um i can't remember if it's the book flint or the book ruble uh the man called noon yeah but they talk he talks about how if if good men don't stand up then all we do is make it harder for the next yeah for the next people to come along yeah right and i don't have it i've, I've posted it the quote on Facebook a few times. I don't remember it word for word, but but it's to that effect. It well, you can run from it, but then you just dump that burden yeah. times ten onto the next people. Yeah, you know, and yeah. So anyway, that that yeah, thing's that, that, real that, strong. That, that, yeah. yeah, and that's a good point, right? He doesn't want to, the sense of duty, but it's not a misplaced sense either. It's it's hmm. a very rare thing to see today because people would just kind of a to kill a mockingbird sense of duty. Yes, it is. It really is. Um, obviously, the whole McCarthyism of that era is very much alluded to in this film, but it's a what, what's going on here is much deeper. Is that there's a very important virtue and truth at stake here. Um, I, I read a book a couple of years ago, interestingly enough, um, and it was um, some testimony from people who survived Marxism in um, Soviet Russia. So they survived under the Soviet communist regime. And apparently in their family, their Christian family home, this was one of the movies they regularly used to watch, and it was like a teaching tool for their kids about virtue and about standing up to, to evil. And it was actually a, a really important sort of um, almost like a, 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 what would you call almost like a, a, a reflection or a meditation for them on how they had to live their lives as well in the midst of this evil that just seems so overwhelming. And especially when your neighbors would turn on you. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's a great, and it still holds up. It still oh, yeah. holds up today. It's, it's about an hour and a half long, so it's not long. There's a fascinating yep. shot, I, and I don't know if it's one of the first ever, but there's an uh, in the opening of the film, there's that um, uh, horse and carriage where, the, where the, the rider rides into town, and there's a, there's a camera mounted on the carriage uh, following it, tracking in with it. And I, the first time I've seen it in a Western of that age or a film of it. So there's some, it's, it's a good film. Still I, I'd up. forgotten mm -hmm. about that. that yeah. I'm trying to think if I've seen that in other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I couldn't, I I couldn't recall much. a film of that age. It's very common now. You just would take it yeah. for granted. But back then, it was very. The camera was normally stuck in one place, and it would move that way or that way or that mm -hmm. way or that way. You know. Yeah. So, and that's where the searches was good. I thought as well. Searches had some new. You see, some of the cinematography is a bit different in the searches. It's not your typical. Yeah. 
sort of um, no, that, that's it's a great film it's mm. it's on my it's in my honorable mentions um, yeah. but yeah it is a good film that's a good pick that's definitely a good pick right well here's the here's the moment of truth number one what's your number one this is hard yeah this between this and number two was hard but uh i i i if i was i was sitting there i was like i gotta be honest with myself really which is the better western film that incorporates everything that i really think needs to be there and it was hard but uh number one for me is unforgiven oh good choice yeah good choice. um it's a great film i mean it's it's very complex and it there's not it's not a it's it's barely an action film yeah it's a drama yeah. it's a drama yeah mm. and um and you can love and hate every character in it yeah you know um it, you know who's right and who's wrong in that film it's pretty hard to decide yeah um and i like that about it a lot i like the gray areas <laughs> yeah yeah well that was that was a film too right it's sort of it's almost like you, you you get the sense that clint eastwood is deconstructing the the sort of the macho myth of his previous characters He's trying Kinda. to give you a you know a sense of reality about what it would have actually been like until the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. He couldn't help himself. I, I imagine the the film studios would have said, "Nah, now nah, you've got to end this according yeah, to some sort of formula." I, I mean, but who's right and who's wrong in this film? I mean, that's the thing yeah. is, it's for those that haven't seen it. You know, the premise is there's this guy who was a terrible, terrible guy, William Money, and and he killed men and women and children and and. Did all these horrible things and then he he settled down and had kids and uh and his wife died and he's trying to raise his kids and then meanwhile these two ranch hands go to a whorehouse and and one of them cuts up one of the women and so the sheriff played by um gene hackman great actor yeah um yeah you know deals with it the best way he can and and he's got some i mean you know he even Gene Hackman talking about love and hate a character in a movie, you know. I mean, when he when he handles that whole situation initially, I love his line when, um, when uh, he's gonna whip these two cowboys as punishment, and then and then he decides instead that they gotta pay all the, they gotta bring in their horses and all this stuff and pay for like basically restitution. Yeah. And the and the lady that runs the whorehouse says they aren't even gonna get a whipping. <laughs> and he says, haven't you seen enough blood for one night? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some real wisdom in that, you know, but anyway, they, these, these, these ladies, these, these, uh, prostitutes put out a bounty on these two cowboys. And, and so this guy comes to, to William money to Clint Eastwood's character and says, Hey, I'm going to go kill these two guys and collect this money. Will you come with me? And, he makes you know he kind you see him struggle with the decision he essentially agrees to do it for the money because he's starving his kid and his kids are starving and and then along the way you know they find ways to kind of rationalize why they're doing it and then they get Dan, uh, morgan freeman involved who is his old partner and i mean you know and you go you watch that film and you, you i i don't know who like i don't know who was right and who was wrong really I mean, yeah, he, and, and I think he, that's the that's the point, though, isn't it? It's, the, yeah. it's the, the whole moral complexity of these people and their lives and 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 what they do and don't do. I mean, for me, it's a film that I think also. I don't know about how you feel about this, but it feels a bit like to me like a film that revived westerns a little bit. It gave it breathed new life into them in a sense. Uh, Clint Eastwood was back. Yeah, um, I, I would say. Yeah, I think I think it did. I don't know how many west. I mean, that was what ninety two, I think ninety one. Yeah, early nineties, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I saw it in high school, my senior year of high school. I just can't remember if I saw it in the fall or the spring. So I don't know if it was ninety one or ninety two, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there were some westerns that flowed from that, I think. But I, I just every time I watch it, you know, it's, um, it's just I really like it, and I see something different in it. I like every time I watch it, and and I think that uh, it's interesting that he goes back, you know after after all this happens he goes back and moves and it says it was rumored that he that he uh, was successful in dry goods you know <laughs> I, mean, and so he, I mean he kind of it 
I think this is kind of the duality of man that they talk about in like Full Metal Jacket, you know. I yeah, mean, yeah. How do you, how do you become this kill, cold-blooded killer again, and then, and then just put that back on the shelf? Um, and don't we all have a little bit of that? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it's yeah, no, it's interesting. It's a great film. I love it. I I gotta give props to the the guy, very guy ending, you know, when he goes in the bar. And, and, and he's he's been drinking again so he's you know and um and he says who owns this establishment <laughs> well that would be me and he just shoots him you know that's right that's he right goes, he just shot an unarmed man and Clint Eastwood <laughs> says well he should have armed himself he's going to decorate the front of his store with my friends yeah that, that's know? right there was some great lines and then Morgan that. Freeman tries to do the right thing he's like I'm not going to do this I changed my mind he leaves yeah. And then he ends up getting caught and killed and he didn't even do anything, you know? That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, and then the boy that talks money into going and doing this kills one of the cowboys, but then can't live with himself, you know? And, and, and he's like, I don't want to do the, I don't want to kill anybody anymore. And, 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 uh, and my favorite line, I always have lines from movies. This <laughs> I'll, I'll end with this, but it's when, yeah. When that kid is trying to come to terms with the fact he just killed a man and he's drinking and and he goes, yeah, well, I guess he had it coming. Yeah. And Clint Eastwood says, we all got it coming, kid. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant, know? wasn't it? Yeah, that was great. That was a great, great writing. So. Well, this was a film too, I think, because uh, Clint Eastwood directed it, right? It was the yep. it was it was the film that really put him on the map as a director. All of a sudden, he went from being that action guy you know, Dirty Harry to, to, oh gosh, he, he's actually, um, he's a good director. And, and that's, that's been his trajectory ever since really. Yeah. And they filmed some of it in Idaho too, as I recall, there's some great landscapes and stuff in it and yeah. high mountain landscapes and. Yeah. That's um, a good choice. Yeah, good choice. So. I, 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 yeah, that's good. It almost <laughs> made it into my top 10, but it just wasn't quite in there for me. Um, <laughs> I had to fit Rango in there. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you had to fit Rango. Rango, Rango pushed out. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? Um, uh, purely emotional pick. Um, my number one is True Grit. And it's okay. the, I like both, but it's the 2010 remake for me that I really you like. Love. the remake. Yeah, yeah. So, again, Joel, Ethan Cohen, the Cohen brothers, Jeff Bridges, Matt Damon. Uh, in fact, um, the original, right, was, um, who was it? Um, Glenn Campbell was in the original. Remember, he played Matt Damon's character, LaBeouf. And yep. um, Hayley Steinfeld, she was great as Maddie Ross. Uh, just, just she. Uh, there was something about the way that character was played. Um, uh, Rooster Cogburn, of course, you know, is a sort of a legendary character. They tried that terrible um, sequel. Remember with... Um, who was it? Uh, Catherine Hepburn and and um, John Wayne in it. They made that oh. Rooster Cogburn film um, in, in 1975, and it's just yeah, no, it's, terrible. <laughs> that was a cash grab. Um, you know, but, I yeah. think the I got to ask you. You know, the Coen Brothers are notorious mm. for early climaxes in the film. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and I always wonder. Like, I thought they did a great job on True Grit, but I, it had to drive them crazy to kind of have to follow the formula you know <laughs> i mean because you can't really change the story you know no um and you can't change the order of events no um, but, but but that's what that's what i love about this was for one of the big things i really love about it, so carter burwell who did the soundtrack i think the soundtrack was so perfect for this and it added everything like i've read the book the original um charles portis novel and i love it and my girls my younger girls have read it they love it. And it's literally, there's a bit more detail because it's a novel, but it's literally what you see on the screen. That adaption is a faithful, it's Maddie Ross. She's narrating the whole book. The yeah. film is like that. It's a very faithful retelling of the original. No, it, it does, that's what I said. It, it's, be, it's better to the story than John Wayne's version was. Yeah, heck yeah. But uh, yeah, but I couldn't put, I, I, I don't know if I could put one above the I tend to like the remake a little better, but I really do like the original too. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, for me, I think that the remake, I, I don't know what it is. There's something about it. It's almost like, it's for me, it's a film that has a great emotional attachment. I could watch this over and over. And I don't mean just a Western, a film that I could watch over and over again. This is one of them, and it just resonates every single time. I love Maddie Ross in this. I thought she was great. You know, when she's she hanging with that guy, you know, at the beginning. 
That, that was that. And, our, and my girls, they love that. Um, here's a fun fact. Uh, that book by Charles Portis, um, uh, True Grit, was originally Roald Dahl. It was his favorite book. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. So he read, in fact, he wrote a review, I think, or an intro or something to one of the versions of it. So, um, so yeah, but there's just, and I like, there's great quotes. You talk about great quotes that, that fill your hands, you know, and they fill your hands. You fill your hands. hands. <laughs> yeah, that was that great. And, great. and I, oft, I often wander around our house just saying to my daughters, because they know what I'm talking about as soon as I say, Rooster Cogburn. And they, they think <laughs> it's hilarious, you know, because they, they, yeah, they, that, there was a couple of moments that scared them. Otherwise, they'd, they'd go back and watch that again. And the, the moment that scared them, was falling into that cave with the snakes. The Funny, hey, that, that, knew, yeah, that was the thing. Before you said me. it, I knew that's what it was going to be. <laughs> and that was it. That's the one thing that otherwise they absolutely love that film. Yeah, yeah. it's a good film. And I think, um, I I don't know. I, I feel like I think about films like that, even not, not, not so much Unforgiven, but films like um, True Grit or... Mm. Oh, let me see. Big Jake, um, yeah. where it's like the 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 quote. I don't remember who said it. It's probably Robert Barron or somebody, uh, or maybe Cardinal Newman or somebody who said, "Saints are just sinners who are extraordinary when it matters." Yeah, yeah. I think that's Newman. You know. It? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I mean, that you got these films about guys who maybe weren't the best guys, but but when it came down to having to decide about what the right thing to do was, you know, it didn't matter that maybe they had these other faults. It what mattered was what they did next, you know? Yeah. And I think that's a cool theme in a lot of these, a lot of these movies. Yeah. It's honestly, and it's a great, there's just so much about it, the way they told that story too. It felt like it was harkening back to another time, you know, modern Westerns tend to be, or now they're more modern, whereas they had the modern acronyms in the way we speak. Whereas this one, you know, even uh, Matt Damon was brilliant, I thought, in this, you know, yeah. when he was talking about giving her a spanking and it was hilarious. He was uh, like, you, you wouldn't hear that today in a film. It just wouldn't, wouldn't, they wouldn't speak no. in that way, you know? No, it was, it was good. Yeah. They they had, a, they did a good job on casting. We were, yeah. I'm not sure who did the casting for that, but um, they picked good actors. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved, I loved the banter. So between her and um, LaBeouf and, and then also between him and um, Rooster Cogburn, you know, they've got that whole rivalry and it's, uh -huh. and it's, it's that they trading insults where you have to stop and pause and think about the insult because you don't hear people insulting each other like that today. And it's very clever and quick witted, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a great film. Um, before we jump into honorable mentions to finish up with, um, I, I was, I, it was interesting. I was going to ask you this at the beginning, but the, uh, the question has been answered certainly for the top 10. Did you have, uh, any of, well, did you have blazing saddles anywhere in your, it's in my honorable in, okay. So we'll come back to that one. What about, um, either hateful eight or Django unchained? Did either of those ever contemplate or cross your mind at any stage? I thought a little bit about hateful eight. Yeah. I didn't put it in there, honestly, because um, I, 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 I don't think that they, it needed to go where it went several times. Yeah, yeah. I, I found I, it very I, long. I found it very long-winded. A lot of people say it was amazing, and, and there's some great dialogue, but then I thought it was just very slow in places. And I think that, they, I mean, again, it's, I mean, I know it was Tarantino, but mm. I, I just... I thought it. I thought it got a little too graphic at times. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I didn't think it. And I didn't think it needed to. It could have stood on its own without it. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't put that one in there. And and did Django Unchained? I I just didn't. I didn't really like. It. I didn't think it was that great of a film, to be honest. Yeah. But well, there's that's one, just me. There's two things I like about that film. One is Christoph Waltz, and uh, he's just a great actor, you know. And and he he was the um, what was he that sold pots? Oh, as a dentist, wasn't he? So, you know. Mm -hmm. But, but the the other thing was um, the uh, the scene with the um, Klansman, with uh, was it Don Johnson's in it? And and that they haven't got the hood sign up right. And uh, like, I mean that was just it was funny. And uh, but the rest of the film, yeah, it was just quite brutal and violent too. It's, um, yeah. on t uh, to be fair, DiCaprio's acting was um, yeah he played a he really did play a character and ch yeah. he chewed the scenery as they say. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, other than that, not a huge fan of it. Okay, let's let's talk about our um, honourable mentions then. So, um, shall we go one for one and see how we get on? So, what what have you got? Start. Give me one of your honourable mentions, starting working our way down the list. Well, I'm going to go like in order. So, yep. 
we, we won't be able to talk about these as much. No. Obviously. Um, if I had to pick number 11, it would be Man from Snowy River. Ah, oh, good choice. Yeah, an, an Aussie classic. Good choice. Yeah. Great film. Yeah. Sigrid so. Thornton, she's in that, eh? Yes. Yeah. I'm, yeah. That's a good choice. Um, I'll, I'll start with a couple of three that were sort of a little bit, perhaps, um, you might not consider Westerns, but I, I sort of, I put them in my honourable mentions because they have an, a quality about them. So one is uh, The Wolverine, which was made by James Mangold. Now, James Mangold made the great biopic about Johnny Cash. He also made the remake of 310 to Yuma. And when you watch The Wolverine, it is a samurai thing, but they're, they're very much the Western elements. Samurai and Western films often have a lot of crossover, if you if you know those similar stories often play out. Um, Sicario was another one, that which had elements. That's a Taylor Sheridan one, elements of a Western, but it's not really at all a Western. And then the third one for me, which really was a lot more Western, was Back to the Future 3. Yeah. And uh, there's something about It's kind of a wholesome sort of sci-fi Western. I, I don't know if you'd ever imagine yeah. those two going together, but yeah. It was cool. It was a cool way to end that trilogy too, you know. Um, yeah, but, yeah, it was a lot of fun, eh? The train. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, can I? Can I also? I'll get, let me jump into my honourable mentions list. Number one on uh, um, on my list here is um, good, the bad, and the ugly. So I've already talked about that. Made it onto my honourable mentions. So there you go. And also hang them high while we're here, actually. So okay. Yeah. Um, I had the next the next three, I guess, on my honourable men mentions list were High Noon. Ah, oh, good choice. Uh, Magnificent Seven. <laughs> yeah. And, which which uh, version? The man who shot Liberty Valens. Oh, that's a good, yeah, good film. What is your um, which, which version of the Magnificent Seven? The one with um, the the old one, the, the original. Yeah, 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 the original. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah, so I, I like both. Our kids love the new one. Uh, yeah. I have a funny. I have a funny feeling it's because Chris um, Chris Pratt, isn't it? So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, but the, yeah, and, and, and I like uh, Denzel as an actor is great, Denzel Washington. And, um, but yeah, I, I, there's something about the new one that is, is great. It's a bit of fun, but the original, you can't beat the original, Yeah, you know, and that funnily enough, that's my, my honorable mentions. Unforgiven was on my honorable mentions. Um, and moving down the, the list, then the Revenant was on there, the, the Leonardo DiCaprio film. Um, yeah, it's, um, it is really more of a period drama, but I think there's that the whole Western element of, of justice and revenge that's there. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I already said, uh, 310 to Yuma was on my honorable mentions. Yeah. And, um, so going down, we've got real Bravo. Ah, uh, good choice. Yeah. Which Cassidy and the Sundance kid. Yep. And, uh, pale rider. Ah, uh, yeah. Pale rider. Yeah. Yeah. I watched that recently actually again. I watched it on a plane somewhere recently. Pell Rider was is a really good one. It 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 just I had a hard time, you know, like I just couldn't put it in the top ten. It just wasn't it didn't have everything it needed and no. It, and it's a little formulaic. It follows a lot of Eastwood's Stranger comes into town. Yeah. You know? uh, <laughs> Secret past saves yeah, the town. So, yeah, and and interestingly enough, another movie that's similar in some ways that I love. It's really not a western at all, but it's it's probably my favorite Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah, is Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, Hidden Past, and you know, but anyway, uh, but those are my next three, and I they're all good films. They're just you know they're they hold they hold their own, but they're not top ten material for me. Okay, so for me, um, we've already talked about Toonstone and Wired Earp. Um, uh, we've talked about the 310 to Yuma remake. I put that in alongside the other one. Um, here's one, though, uh, The Wild Bunch. Oh, Wild, okay. Yeah, and, and, and there's, it, it's, it's not, I wouldn't call it a, it's, it's more, it, really, again, it's that dark, gritty, Sam Peckinpah made it. It's a, it's a, it really is almost a deconstruction of the Western mythology. Um <laughs> And and they're, they're basically they are um, they are lovable outlaws really they're not they're not good guys but um, yeah there's just I don't know there was something about it it's it's to me it's not the complete film funnily enough but there's moments in that film that I just yeah I, yeah. I quite liked so so the wild bunch for me um, and then also um, Bone Tomahawk which was a western horror with um, I'm trying to think who it was. Um, I've got Val Kilmer on the brain, but it's not him. It is, uh, uh, and I can see it's uh, Kurt Russell. 
Kurt oh. Russell. And and it's and and uh, yeah, it's it's not quite what you think it is, and it, it it's it's this um uh, yeah, it's, it turns out this this uh, well they are like a, a really primitive. A tribe of monsters, effectively, that are, that are chasing them, and and uh, they think they're dealing with regular Indians. They're not, and uh, yeah. For those who haven't seen it, there's a they um they 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 have a bone in their throat. They scream through their throat. It's, it's the most bizarre. But it was, uh, it was I haven't a, seen it. Oh, it was as an indie film too, made on a budget, but really really well made. And uh, so yeah yeah, it was something. It's a bit violent, by the way. It's not a family film at all. So yeah, okay. that, that's me. What about what else you got into this, mate? Oh, okay. I got uh, High Plains Drifter. Ah, uh, good choice. Um, I've got well, and the reason I put okay, High Plains Drifter. It's not that great of a film, honestly. I mean, it's cool. It's fun. It's it's dark, you know. But the thing I like about it is it's sort of like not not that it's a karma thing, but just that the judge there's judgment, right? That yeah, yeah. You can't escape your sins, you know. No. And if you're going to do underhanded stuff, then you're going to pay for it at some point. Yeah. You know, um, I don't believe in karma, obviously, as a Catholic, but I do believe in judgment one day. And and I can't go, well, I, I, I sinned and committed immoral acts for the good of society. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know, and they sold this guy out to save their town after he saved their lives, you know. So. Anyway, I that's why I put that in there. Oh, I like that's that good thing. Choice. Uh Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Great film. It? And and you know, again, you watch a lot of old westerns that are Civil War sort of period uh pieces. The South's always just these terrible guys and they're just yeah. kind of dehumanized, you know, and people forget that the South, just because you were fighting for the South didn't mean you necessarily endorsed slavery or even owned slaves. Yeah, you know, and and so it it wasn't. Yes, that was the primary issue surrounding that war, but people fought for both sides for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, and and so it's it it, it, it I like that I like that movie, Josie Wales, and there's some good good band, good dialogue and stuff in it too. But uh, and then um, Shane. Oh, um, Shane's on my list as well. Yeah. Shane, it's funny. Um, I'm going to talk about Shane in just a second, but um, yeah. So Shane's on my list. We'll come. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, Wind River, um, which is a Taylor Sheridan one, uh, a more recent film. Uh, again, it's a neo western um, with uh, what's his name, Jeremy Rayner, the guy who played Hawkeye in all the Marvel movies, and he's a uh, he's a guy who's paid by the local authorities to hunt and trap and kill animals, and he stumbles across basically a, a group of um, what are they, oil the miners or something who have who've killed a a young Indian girl, and they they're going to get away with it, and um, and basically he becomes embroiled in this plot, and this sort of the snowy tundra. There's an FBI officer who comes out to assist him, and and it's really uh, one thing that Taylor Sheridan does is he he sort of ex examines the the plight of the sort of particularly Native Americans now, and a lot of those modern spaces that are not healthy where they're living, and 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 that very much is a big theme in this the whole Native American um, aspect to it, and it, it's just it's a great it's um. Yeah, it's a drama. It's a sort of neo-Western. Um, Shane, of course, is on my list. Um, and um, now, before I talk about Shane, he, here's a classic. I, I know you're going to mention Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles is not on my list of, of honourable mentions. I was so torn about that one. Um, but Support Your Local Sheriff is on my list. James Garner. And I, it's just because I was a kid and I you know, I grew up with it. And I, it's funny, yeah, but I was like, Blazing Saddles, all right, that's a musical. But Support Your Local Sheriff really is as well. So, you know, it's quite funny, eh? <coughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, so you got you had Blazing Saddles, though. I do, yeah. I, <laughs> I had to pick two comedies. Yeah. And, or I had to pick a comedy and a musical. Yeah. I felt like I had to have a musical on there. And, and I had to have a comedy, but then I ended up basically with two comedies and one of them's a musical too. So <laughs> Blazing Saddles, and then I've got Cat Baloo. Oh, yeah, Cat Baloo, yeah. And and Cat Baloo is, I, I'm not a fan of Jane Fonda, but I really like that movie. And Lee Marvin's in it. And I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. You know, uh, Nat King Cole and, um, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name now. Danny, Danny Kay, right? Danny Kay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Nat King Coast sing the songs, yeah. and it, it's 
Yeah. How's this? How's this for classic? We were listening to Nat King Co on vinyl just this morning before the kids went off to school. So there is. Was it Danny K? Yeah, oh, this is Danny K, isn't it? Let me let me let me check it right now. Oh, I can do this. The magic of of um. It's driving me crazy now because I don't. Here we go, Stubby K. Stubby K. Yeah, yeah. Not Stubby K. Yeah, Stubby K. <laughs> we're like, yeah, Danny K. Yeah, of course it's Danny I'm K. I'm like, Danny K is not that short and round. I'm oh, like, that's so K. funny. <laughs> W K, yeah, yeah Nat Cole, King perfect Cole. harmony, and there's anyway. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. Um, well, for me, I've the last of mine. Well, the last two, and they're tied together. Shane, Shane's on there. I mean, it is one of those sort of classics. But then also, I've got um one that you might not think of as a western, but I really do think it is. Again, it's a James Mangold film, and it is Logan, the the, oh. the yeah the X Men film about Logan. You know, the Wolverine. Yeah. So it's the film after the Wolverine. Um, you see a lot of what he was trying to do, I think, in The Wolverine. He gets right about Logan. And here's the interesting thing about um, Logan, that film Logan. There's a scene when um, Pro Professor X, who's now an elderly man with these superpowers, but he's got dementia. And it's quite a beautiful sort of story. And they're on a journey together. And he's sitting in a hotel room, and he, he's watching um, that scene from Shane, that famous scene where he gets on his horse and rides off. And... There's so many things about that because there's the the the, Wall, uh, the Logan movie is a very similar sort of story that you've got going on the guy who saves um, this sort of family um, and and from the evil villains, um, but also um, Alan Ladd played Shane in the movie Shane and Alan Ladd Jr. his son was became a producer at Fox Movies and he was the guy who greenlit Star Wars. Without his backing, it never would have been made. The the, 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 the studio didn't want to touch it, but Alan Ladd Jr. went, in, Jr. went into bat for George Lucas, and that film, um, they, they made that film, and, and sort of the rest is history. So, you know, it yeah. saved the studio in a lot of ways. So, there you go. Right on. Uh, I've got, I guess I had more than 13. I, I've got <laughs> I've got three more on my list. Yeah, uh, spell young, them out. Tell us what you got. Uh, young Guns. Young guns. Oh, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, Did you? what did you think of that? Yeah, okay, Young Guns, um, yeah. I like that film. You know, it, it, it again, it's, it came out at a time that movies were really over the top and stuff. But I'm a big fan of Lou Diamond Phillips. Mm. I think he's a fantastic actor. I feel bad he's never got to play a Filipino, which is what he is. <laughs> he's That's always right. a Mexican or an Indian. That's or right, yeah. Um, but... Uh, he's a fantastic actor that I don't think has ever gotten the accolades that he he's deserved. And, and, and he, in so many ways, I felt like made that movie. I mean, you know, Emilio Estevez over the top is Billy the kid and, you know, but really Lou Diamond Phillips and his turmoil and, and his, he's got the moral compass and going on. And I, I don't know. I just, I just, yeah, that's a good call. I like call. Native American stuff too. Because there was Kiefer I, Sutherland, wasn't it? As well, wasn't it? There Kiefer was big, Sutherland. They, they, they were like they were the hot young actors, but but Lou Diamond Phillips was really. You're right. He he sort of holds that film. Um, I thought he did, but um, and then I got um, the Sackets. Oh, I never heard of that. It was a series like Lonesome Dove, but it was yeah. back in the, like '79. Yeah, and it's based on Louis L'Amour's novels of the of, of the Sacketts, the Sackett family from Tennessee, and um, and Tom Selleck and Sam Elliott play the leads in it, and it's it's good, it's really good. Um, the Sacketts. If you get, if you can find it, I tried to find it, and I, I can't find it, but but it's 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 pretty solid. And then my last one was uh, Quigley Down Under. Oh, Quigley, that's classic. That's Tom Selleck, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, I've, so. I've got that somewhere on a DVD, I think, in my collection, buried away deep. That, uh, yeah, yeah people forget Tom Selleck made an appearance in some some westerns, eh? Yeah, he's yeah, he's. he's yep. My my um my only other one was Gunfight at OK Corral was on my my um didn't quite make it into the top ten, but it's in my um my recommended, or you know my my uh, uh, highly um sort of notable exceptions that didn't quite it was and it was a real for me it was a real again a tough one because i love that film there's something about it i have an emotional connection with it but uh yeah. there you go well pete that was awesome what a what a great discussion now folks um if you're tuning in out there we'd love to hear your thoughts so let us know what you think in the comments section do you think we got it right do you agree do you disagree <laughs> if we miss stuff let us know we'd love to love to hear your thoughts if not hopefully it's given you some inspiration to go and hunt down some movies now and maybe reminisce or watch them for the first time. Pete, uh, my friend, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And we're in the Christmas thank season, you. so Merry Christmas. We're still, we can Merry say Christmas that Christmas a few days you. ago, but Merry Christmas. So bless you, bro. It was great. Thanks for tuning in, team. All right. We'll see you.